I am Dr. Charles Mitchell. I'm a World War II veteran. I was uh, a captain and I had command of ACA, 526th Armored Infantry Battalion. I've been asked to talk to you about the battle that took place in uh, Belgium, along the coast of France and Germany, officially known as the Battle of Ardennes, but commonly known by us as the Battle of the Bulge. This is the largest land battle of World War II. 600,000 soldiers involved in this operation. This is the largest battle ever fought by American troops in the world. There was 19,000 killed in, in two days. There was uh, 62,000 wounded in two days. And there were 23,000 of our men taken prisoners in those days. It was the, had the heaviest battle toll of any American operation in the history of our country. This is an account of what happened to me during this battle. A small part of it, but it's, uh, it will give you an idea of what happened many times by many different outfits and many different units throughout the uh, Ardennes sector of uh, Belgium. My company was staying a living. We call it billeting. We billeted it in a little, in a chateau called the Chateau de Grimonster. It was a large place and I had to about 200 uh, to about 200 men were billeted in that. Now, of course, they were down on the floor and everywhere. They weren't in palatial bedrooms or anything like that. But it beat being out in the weather, you know, in the tents or in a foxhole or someplace like that. So we were waiting there. On the 17th of December, 1944, I got this messenger from my battalion head for us to come. I went directly to his office to his, his castle. He had another castle somewhere over there. So we, and we all the company commanders met there at this place. Okay, now he, uh, he told us, he says there's some activity in front of us. We're not sure, we don't have much information about it, but we have been told by, by our commander, which was shape headquarters at the time, that we are to move up to contact, or to, to block it, or to stop, it, because we think the Germans are coming through and we want to put our output because there's not anybody else left up here to do it. If we don't do it, it will not get done. In the afternoon, we, fought, uh, we, we, we took off from our little chateau and we started to, the, to go, we don't know where. We just started out we were, went where we were told to go. So we went down this road and went down this road behind and it was beginning to get dark. Now you can't put lights on during, in, a, in a, what we call a combat area because they'll see you, you know, and, and shoot at you. So we kept, we kept out everything black. We had what we call driving blackout lights, but they weren't much use to you. Anyway, we went down through the dark, these small little roads there, and when we finally came to a place uh, right on the border here, we uh, went into a little town, which was called Stable Oak, Belgium, a small town there. And there was a Corps of Engineers station in this little town. And so when we got there, they said, oh, are we happy to see you? And uh, this man that told me, he says, now listen, here's the river, the Amberley River. The Germans are all back in here, we think. We're not sure. But we heard some activity back in there. We think they may be back there. And so I brought 200 men in. I put them in the square. I parked my half tracks all up in here, and I put 200 men, and I brought them down here. I kept one platoon, that's five, four, five half tracks, back here. We call that in reserve, so that I could use them, you know, wherever I needed to if something happened. I took one platoon and ran along the river back here, and another platoon and ran along the river back there. Well, you, you don't know what's over there, and you got to find out. So I sent two of these half tracks across the river bridge here, up here where it divided, up along these roads up here to try to find out what was up there, so that I have an idea about what was up against. This goes up a hill right here, and on top of this hill, we had these, we had radios at that time, they were invented. <laughs> but uh, they, uh, and, and he called to me and he says, 
I hear lots of activity going on up here. There's lots of movement. And I said to him, there's no need to stay up here. We will defend the river. We will defend the river. Come back across the river. And, and, uh, and we will stay next to the river. Okay, they started back down. We didn't know it, but the Germans were all in these buildings. Well, they, let them, see, they let them go through the first day. When they started back, they took a steel cable and they put it, stretched it across the road. And when this half track came back down there, it ran into this cable and turned the half track over. Then, of course, they began to shoot and fire at the people who were laying on the ground or tried scrambling around. These men, uh, they, they, but the other half track got across the bridge all right. But this, the men in this half track had to swim the river. It was not, fortunately, it was not very deep. That you know, they're deep back there, like deep at the time. So they were able to get back across the river. Okay, shortly after that is when action started. The Germans have a way of letting you know when they're getting ready to attack you. These Germans had a, 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 a one of those things they fired up and it screamed. It made a screaming or <laughs> like that. And uh, they, we called them the screaming meanies, is what we called them. We got into this town at about three o'clock, four, three, three o'clock in the morning. There was no moon, there was an overcast sky, it was in December, it was cold, there was fog off the river, and you could not see almost at the end of that room is about all you could see, it was so dark. Now let, 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 let me stop at this point. Have you, ha, have you ever been scared in your life? Have you ever been almost bitten by a dog or something like that? Darkness is frightening when you don't know what's going on around you. So I'm sure you may have, some of you may have experienced the fact that darkness causes, causes us a lot of, of trouble. Then you understand somewhat what we, how we felt. We felt that way all the time because we didn't know what was coming, we didn't know what was going to happen next. And we knew that our life was in danger, we knew that, because any minute, some of us could have been killed. So uh, we got there in the darkness, and just uh, as light broke through, the screaming Mimi went off. Now, I had taken, I had taken my men with rifles were along this river here. I put my machine guns right here. I put one over here and one over here, you know, kind of fire down so that I could protect the bridge, you know, because that's what our object was, to protect the bridge. Well, when the screaming memes went off, the Germans started to cross this bridge. Now, they came slowly at first, and I said, oh, don't, don't fire. And so they began to come more and more, and they began to get, when they got right about here, I told them to fire. And of course, uh, they would have a straight line right there on the bridge, and they fired across the bridge like that. And we, we, we killed a lot of those people, unfortunately, I'm sorry. And, and, uh, and they could, did not get across the bridge. They fell back, what we call, they fell back. And when they fell back, we, they, 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 they waved the little white flag, and we allowed them to come across on the bridge, pick up their dead and wounded, and move them back. Well, things were quiet for a little bit. And then the Germans decided, man, we're not going to get across there with that. There's too many people on the other side. So they began to, they began to pound us with what we call artillery. They're exploding right down there, right close to you, see? And they're making a hole in the ground, this big around, you know, and that deep. And they're hitting the building and just completely bricks flying everywhere and uh, knocking buildings down. And, uh, and, and, and if you're, and if you happen to be close by, you maybe got it too, you know, along with the building. So we, uh, we, we, we laid low. You can't run. You've got to stay there. Your object is to protect that bridge. So you get down and get under something and you stay there. Then the artillery barrage, what we call lifted. They quit shooting at us for a while. Those of us left and kill many, two or four or five, maybe something like that. So we were lucky out of all those men, it didn't, didn't kill very many, you see. But so we, as soon as that quit, we got up ready, you know, to shoot again and look around to see. And so here the infantry came back on the bridge again. And we did the same thing. And they, they retreated back across the bridge. And, 
and but no artillery came. But we heard something else, and you, you immediately that they that there were the tanks were coming down, and we had no protection whatsoever. They had tanks like this, large, that we could you know we shoot against that, and it just backs off. You no. Know. In my company, I had what we call a 57 millimeter cannon. It's got a, it's wheel drawn, and uh, and it shoots a shell. Okay, this is called my anti-tank gun, but it, well, it had no effect hardly against the German armor that was that way. So we put an anti-tank, one anti-tank gun here, and one anti-tank gun there. Then we, then, then the tanks came down the hill, and we shot, shot one from this tank, shot one, and hit in the wheels, you know, the tank, we hit the wheels, uh, the wheels down here in the tank, and knocked it out, see, because it couldn't run anymore. So it stopped there, but they, they soon pushed it out of the way, and here came tanks across this bridge here. Now, my 57, I said to him, shoot low. If you shoot low, you'll hit the underbelly of this tank, see, and we'll destroy it. He said, okay. So when the tank was coming across the bridge, he shot at this tank. Instead of hitting right here, his shell hit right along here, up here where the slanting part is on the top, and the shell hit the thing, and just went up in the air, and you could see it go way up in the air. And I said, oh, me, because that was the only chance we had of, uh, of getting rid of that tank. So it immediately lowered this big gun, this is called this is called the German 88. He loaded this gun on my tank gunner that was sitting here. And I was standing maybe right in this, right here, you see. And he, he lowered the gun on this tank, and then, it, then just completely, one shell just completely evaporated the crew. They were just gone. There's nothing, nothing left. There. So the tank came across the, came across the bridge. Now, after the tank got across the bridge, we have another instrument that we use and, uh, to help us, and that was, that is a bazooka. It's a long stovepipe affair, and you put a shell in one end, and somebody holds it on their, on, their, uh, hold it on their shoulder, and they fire it, and it shoots a shell out, and that's what we call our anti-tank bazooka. Uh, the tank that came over, our anti-tank bazooka, hit this tank, and we knocked this tank out. And it ran into a building, ran into a building, and stopped the uh, progress of their tanks temporarily. They moved the tank out of the way, and here they came, all in, with tanks down there, all down there, and firing into us. And the infantry, of course, moved behind the tanks. They sneaked behind the tank, moved behind the tank, and, uh, and, uh, and, and I could see that there were just hordes of them coming over the hill, hundreds of them. Thousands of them coming across the hill. This was the first U.S. Well, this was the first U.S. Adolf Hitler passing the division, and uh, it was one of the best that they had in the, in, the, in the German army at that time. So I called to my battalion commander, "You can't move." I said, "This, there's no way we can defend this bridge. We don't have enough men. They're pouring down on all over stuff. They will be. It will be suicide to remain at this place." Uh, so they said, well, remove, move back. We began to find them. troops scattered all over here, troops scattered all over there, and firing and tanks coming in, and more shells hitting and hitting and people getting killed. Have you ever been outside and a bee come by your head goes <laughs> kind of like that? A bullet when it comes past you. It, it sounds like a bee, you know, going by <laughs> like that. And when it goes by, you, you thank yourself because it's missed you. But the man behind you may not be so lucky. And you see, when you're fighting like that and watching, you have no compassion, let us say. If your friend, which you've been with a long time, is, is shot here and he falls, you can't go over to him and hug him and say, oh, I'm so sorry uh, that you're hit. You know, I, uh, I, I hope you hadn't gotten hit like that. You stay on your place where you are. You look to the front and watch the enemy, and you call out in a loud voice, Medic! And let him take care of your best friend. So, at this point, we, we gradually begin to go out of town. We, we go what is called, what is called uh, a negative advance, is what we do. 
we put a line of soldiers this way and a line of soldiers behind them. The line of soldiers behind them shoot over the front soldiers and the front soldiers move out and pass through you and set up another line behind you up there. That's how we would retreat gradually, gradually. And to keep control, we gradually went back and back. So we got out of town and up the, I started up the hill on the other side. Now, let me tell you, Hitler, in planning all this, knew that we had plenty of gasoline supply in Belgium. He says, hey, we'll get, we'll get enough gasoline to get us through Belgium. And when we get to Belgium, we'll take the American supply of gasoline. And that will make us go all the way through, and that will make us put us clear to the sea. And so they intended to get our gasoline. And we were going up the hill out of uh, out of this town here, up, up the hill up here. Uh, we ran across a gasoline dump that was filled with four five rows high, you can see, and it extended down the road for five miles. And two million gallons of gasoline in this dump right here. Okay, as we were coming up the hill, we uh, we heard the, the German tanks coming in behind us. They, we knew they want that gasoline and wanting it bad. So we would, we, I'd say, fire into the German into the gasoline and set it on fire. With my 50 caliber machine gun from my half track fired into that gasoline, and <laughs> nothing happened. And I could hear those tanks coming up the hill behind. Me. So you know, but we we were I'm, I'm upset again. You know, that thing's not working out right. So I got one guy go and get a five gallon can, open it, you know, spread it down like that, come to where we were, and we just light it with a match, boom, and away it went everywhere. Ended up with flames, flames like that. There was woods on each side of the tank, of the, of the, of the, each side where the tanks could not get through the woods. So it stopped temporarily. And while we were there, trying to cover as best we could, we heard some movement to our rear. And I said to the men, oh, we've been surrounded, we've been surrounded, we've got to turn part of our equipment back and defend ourselves from the rear. And then somebody who was back there said, American troops! And it was another division. It happened to be the Tennessee 30th Division from, uh, uh, from Jackson, Tennessee, a man I knew was in charge of this man saying, the 30th Division came up to save our lives, boy, and saved our lives. We were so happy that we had uh, our friends came to, to us help and support. And uh, so we uh, went back into this little town and took over the town. And uh, that's, that, that is a small part of the Battle of the Budge, which I took part in. 